The story begins when Jethro Tull gets back to England and his hoe kicks English agriculture into high gear, triples the yield and makes English farmers a lot of dough. And incidentally triggers a chain of events that will end up leading to nothing less than the French Revolution. So here we are where the revolution really begins, the home of every true lover of French food, a bakery. Bonjour, madame. Trois baguettes, s'il vous plaît. Think about it. Where are we, 1760 or so? The lunatic in charge is Louis XV. Unlike England, French agribusiness is in deep doo-doo. I mean, the price of a loaf is insane. C'est combien, madame? The national economy is not too hot either. And nor is Madame de Pompadour. She's the king's mistress and she's frigid. But her in-house doctor, a certain Francois Kinney, fixes that. And then, around 1768, the good doctor comes up with a modest suggestion for, well, total national economic recovery based on his entirely erroneous understanding of English farming techniques. Run France like a giant English estate. Which Kenet takes, wrongly, to mean leave nature and everything else alone to do its thing. OK, time for a very brief word about economic theory. Kinney's idea about leaving things alone to do their thing became known as laissez-faire. Free trade, we'd call it. The reason I can buy this Japanese car anywhere, for instance. Back then, what Kinney meant was that if the French government introduced free trade, that would stimulate the economy and stop the place from generally going down the tubes. Well, they didn't. So, it did. Laissez-faire, leaving things alone and not interfering, got people wanting the government to do the same thing for them. If the government don't give us more personal freedoms, shouted the mob, life will get really savage. Well, they didn't. So it did. That word, savage, is why we're in Switzerland, with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, nature lover, philosopher, and a general ladies' man, as you can see. Rousseau's busy stirring things up about going savage, by which he means the simple life, society living together by democratic consent, with commonly agreed laws, no private property, freedom of speech, governments that were voted in so they could be voted out. Above all, real social equality. The whole caboodle running according to a social contract everybody signed up for. Good, eh? Except remember where and when we are. 1770 odd. And this lunatic Russo is bad mouthing a king by divine right and military muscle, aristocrats who've owned serfs for centuries, and giant corrupt government bureaucracies running on kickbacks. And worst of all, he comes from this place, Geneva, a republic. Well, the French Royal Army invades Geneva for a start. Too little, too late. Because basically, the French Revolution is just around the next corner. This was the world the revolution destroyed. You can tell what it must have been like. Formal, everything in its place, including you. Classified, lower class, middle class, upper class. A universe that science said was a machine with people just cogs in the machine. The triumph of order. Small wonder when the French Revolution hit, 
things went to the opposite extreme. The obedient, impersonal masses were out. The caring, emotional individual was in. The new romantic art of the period says it all. Individuals turning their back on society to explore their feelings. So what were feelings? Well, to the keen medical eye, the real question was much bigger. What was the physiology of feeling? How did your senses work? Let's see, shall we? Open your eyes wide, please. Thank you. Hmm. Now I'd like you to concentrate on something. This is Berlin, where the next bit happened. Now I'd like you and everybody watching the program to close your eyes and not open them until I say so. Hmm? Okay, close your eyes. Now, unless there's something wrong with your eyes, rub lightly on your closed eyelids. See those images happening? OK, open your eyes, please. Did you see anything? Good. That's the kind of thing a doctor called Muller got up to in Berlin around 1840. Thing was, where were those images you saw on your eyelids? Not anywhere here, hmm? All right. Another test. Please, turn your ear towards this light and shut your eyes again. Go ahead. And now turn back to me and open your eyes again, please. Could your ear see the light? Good. Now, please hold up a hand. Can you feel this colour? Good. That'll be all, thank you. Well, that's what Muller found out, that each sense does a different job, that we don't perceive the world, we only feel different sensations coming in through each different sense. And then we put it all together, we being what Muller called the nervous system. And that was the first time anybody'd thought of the nervous system like that, as an active rather than a passive thing. But enough of my voice for the moment. In 1854, Muller's pupil Helmholtz investigated hearing. Sound made something in your ear vibrate. So was it like singers making piano strings vibrate? Did different bits of your ear vibrate to different sound wave frequencies? Did sound travel at different frequencies? But it was when Helmholtz's pupil went on to see if electricity did the same thing that he kind of changed the world. What he wanted to know was, does electricity move? And if so, how? And if so, what does it do? So, thank you. Please observe, here we have a big spark jumping this gap. Thank you. Here I have a small wire loop almost completely joined. Now, I walk out precisely this distance. Now, please observe, this time there will be a big spark and a little spark. Thank you. Once more, a big spark and a little spark. Thank you. Exactly the same distance once again. Please observe, a big spark and a little spark. Thank you. Once more, precisely the same distance. Thank you. Heinrich Hertz, who did all this, found out that electricity goes out like ripples from the big spark, and the little sparks happen only at the crest of each of the ripples. In other words, once every wavelength. I said he changed the world with all this. Actually, he didn't. Whiskey did. Thanks to a beautiful Irish whisky heiress called Annie Jameson, you may recognise the brand, who eloped with an Italian and ended up here, outside Bologna, at the Villa Griffone. 
The villa, you'll note, sits on top of what is perhaps the least attractive mausoleum in the history of Mausolea. Designed by that well-known architect, Benito Mussolini, for our hero, Annie's clever son, William. Who was inspired by a local physics prof to try sending electrical wave ripples across the valley here to his brother. All William really did was to take Hertz's little trick and make it go further. OK, here's the other end of the experiment, getting into position at the top of a hill across the valley and setting up the receiver to receive. Well, that's what we all hope. He rigs up a tall aerial because that makes long waves that go further, and then he turns the current on and off three times. That's S in Morse code. Point. Now for the big one. Look. Here's the receiver disappearing over the hill with his gun. Now, here's the receiver waiting behind the hill with his gun. And that was the point of the gun to tell William the incredible news that his little electrical S's have gone over a hill. Well, after this, there's no holding William Marconi. In 1901, he gets more S's to go around something a little bigger. The Earth. From Cornwall in England to St John's, Newfoundland, with the aerials held up by kites. So, by 1912, Radio was kind of science fiction come true. There was a transatlantic radio telegraph service, the first signal from a plane to the ground, and somebody nearly saved the Titanic. And all the while, Marconi's little S's went further and further around the world. On one occasion, from Britain all the way to Buenos Aires. And all without bothering Marconi as to why. But why? Well, the BBC helped. as soon as Marconi had done the Newfoundland thing, researchers were announcing that there might be some great radio wave reflector in the sky, bouncing the signals around the Earth. And the more they beamed BBC radio programmes upwards, P.S. note the mode address in the BBC studios at the time, the more they recognised that some of the radio programmes came back down and some did not, and that this changed with the season, day, night, even the weather. Now, they know radio goes 186,000 miles a second, so the returning signals tell them there are several reflecting layers 60 to 300 miles up. But only atoms of air missing some electrons, ionised air, would reflect radio waves. Or, if the air weren't ionised, let them through. So what can be knocking electrons out of air atoms? Some Austrian called Hess discovers that ionization is four times up there what it is down here and says it's all being caused by what he modestly calls Hess rays. Turned out one source of the mystery rays was this. Solar flares that spewed out billions of particles that hit the Earth a couple of days later and ionized the atmosphere. But ionization still happened even when the sun wasn't having solar flares. So there had to be a source beyond the sun. Oh, well, now we're into the big time. They changed the name from Hess rays to cosmic rays. Which is, of course, why I'm here in the Redwoods. 
Looking for tree rings. Ah. You see how each ring is a year's growth? But look at that fat ring there. That means a lot of growth that year. That means a lot of rain. And again, and again, and again, and again, every 11 years. And guess what? They find out that the sun has flares and spots and such in the same 11-year cycle. So in the 1930s, a weather expert called Morkley decides to take a closer look at this sunspot weather relationship. Now, this is going to involve a humongous amount of calculation. And right next to him are some people counting cosmic ray particles with these vacuum tubes. Turns on and off when the particles hit it. So Morkley tries it with electrical signals instead. And it works. They turn it on and off too. Bingo, says Morkley. That means, at which point, enter World War II, and before he knows what's hit him, his great idea has been taken over by the army. But not for weather forecasting. The army needed an adding machine. See, calculating artillery tables to tell gunners how to aim their guns accurately was a nightmare. There were so many variables, it took hotshot mathematicians 24 hours to calculate one shell trajectory. So, in 1942, either we found a quicker way to do arithmetic, or we lost the war. And we didn't, so you know we did. And anyway, I'm near the end of the show. It was Morkley and weather forecasting that did the trick. Remember the vacuum tube and how those signals turned it on and off? Well, here's what Morkley did with that. I'll show you with wine bottles since we're back at that French vineyard. OK, sets of ten vacuum tubes. Ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, and so on. Now, say you want to add 21 and 101. You send in a signal to the ones to turn one tube on, and then two signals into the tens. 20, one. 101's the same. One signal into the ones, and one signal into the hundreds. Now, to add it all up, you just send the number of signals in that will turn everything off. Two. Twenty-two. One hundred and twenty-two. And keep on adding sets of ten, and you can add sums in the trillions in a split second. Solved the artillery problem, won the war, end the show.